Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome to today's session to review the close economic ties between New York and the provinces of Quebec and Ontario. And we couldn't have two better subject matter, matter, uh, matter experts, that is, for today's session to help us to understand that relationship and how it can help to expedite a post-pandemic rebound in the economy of all three markets. Catherine Louvier, uh, Delegate General of Quebec's delegation to New York, and Ian Todd, Ontario's representative to the United States based at the Canadian Embassy in Washington, DC. Welcome uh, both Catherine and Ian to our session today. I'm John Costanzo, Executive Director of Maple's New York chapter. I joined in June of 2020 to help launch its presence here in New York in the New York metropolitan area. And uh, that was after serving as president of Pure Later International for the previous 18 months, Pure Later's US company. It's a pleasure to join our distinguished guest today to discuss this important trade and trilateral relationship between uh, New York and the provinces of Ontario and Quebec. Uh, first, as for today's agenda, uh, after a brief overview uh, of our organization, we'll have some introductory remarks by both Ian and Catherine, followed by an in-depth discussion regarding our trade relationship. Uh, and uh, then we'll have some time for you to ask some questions. But before we begin, a little housekeeping. Uh, you may have noticed your phones are muted uh, so we can have the best audio experience today, not because we don't want to hear what you have to say. If you have any questions for our panelists, please be sure to enter them into the Zoom chat box. We're also recording today's event and a copy will be made available to everyone through uh, follow-up communication from Maple. And again, questions are welcome, so please be sure to enter those into the Zoom dashboard and we'll be monitoring that throughout the uh, presentation today. As for Maple, our community is growing. Our members now are represented across 21 business sectors. Uh, and uh, most of 80% that is of our members uh, serve at the director level or above in uh, more senior roles. And you can see across the bottom here, the industry sectors that represented it's a very wide spread and the color chart I think depicts that quite well. And our geographic footprint is equally broad. Maple members uh, are based throughout 17 Canadian and US markets stretching from Vancouver and LA in the West to Montreal and New York in the East. And our split of membership between the US and Canada is also quite balanced. 60% of our members are based in the United States, 40% in Canada. So again, a well-balanced organization with members having interests in both the US and Canada uh, and we're growing. We're pleased today to welcome two new executive members, both from Vancouver, Ms. Olina Poliski, Managing Director of Art One Translations, whose agency provides multilingual translation, uh, translations, that is, she could help me, I think, <laughs> work for uh, firms internationally, and uh, Marco Dekovic, uh, Vice President of Public Affairs at Global Container Terminals, a uh, company that operates uh, terminals in the ports of Vancouver, New York, and New Jersey. And we're excited today to announce that the government of Quebec has joined Maple through the Delegate General Office in New York. Bienvenue to Catherine and the Quebec delegation team. So we're growing and thriving and looking forward to uh, continuing to expand our community throughout the United States and Canada. And one of the ways Maples brings our members value is through, is through what we refer to as storytelling or cross-border storytelling. For instance, our most recent interview conducted was with Nigel Neal, Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner at the Consul General of Canada in New York, who provided great insights into the mission of the consulate here in New York and their many trade and investment initiatives. You can find that posted on our Maple website if you'd like to hear Nigel's uh, interview. And our monthly Momentum newsletter is a platform for members and partners to share cross-border insights uh, with other members. Our recent articles have included a very insightful forecast, if you haven't seen it yet, on the Canadian economy in 2021 by RSM Chief Economist Joe Bruellis. Uh, to quote Joe, I think he said something along the lines of we're two countries separated only by a different currency. Um, and an equally interesting uh, uh, article was uh, written by in, in, on diversity and equity and inclusion 
uh, work that we've done here at Maple and a model for secure networking and communications from Toronto-based QA consultants. So please, if you haven't seen those, I, I'd encourage you to go to our website and review those articles in Momentum. Now as for what's coming next in uh, quarter one, we have a very full uh, agenda. If I can get to that, there we go. Uh, first, uh, in uh, Southern California, our next event is on March 4th. Uh, we have presentations from Kenobi Martins and RSM planned for that event. And then uh, our spring event here in New York on St. Patty's Day. We'll celebrate uh, not only St. Patrick's Day, but uh, also we'll hear from the Toronto Stock Exchange and Purolator International. And then last but not least, at uh, the end of the month, uh, British Columbia will hold an event and a presentation from uh, Brookfield on uh, the LA development projects, including the LA Fashion District. So hopefully you'll be able to join us uh, for all of those events and you can RSP for these uh, again on our website. But now let's turn our attention to today's event by beginning to welcome our guests. First, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Ian Todd, Ontario's representative to the US today. Uh, Ian, who is appointed by Ontario Premier Doug Ford in January of uh, 2019. His priorities are driving trade and growth between the highly integrated Ontario and New York economies, uh, supporting US companies in global expansion through contacts uh, with Ontario uh, companies and opportunities. And he served as political advisor to several premiers, federal, uh, provincial cabinet ministers, two federal leaders of the official opposition and the prime minister of Canada. So welcome Ian, we, pleasure to have you with us today. And if I can jury rig this slide here, there we go, okay. And it's also my distinct pleasure to welcome Catherine Lubier, Delegate General of Quebec in New York is our guest. Uh, Catherine also has a equally interesting career and one second. She was appointed uh, on February 19th uh, former uh, Deputy Chief of Staff in the Quebec Premier Office before that, where she led the transition of the new government. From 216 to 218, she served as a general manager in the office of the President, then Alliance Communication Global Director for Renault Nissan Mitsubishi, based in Paris. So good industry experience as well as government experience. And in government, she served as advisor to Prime Minister Stephen Harper from 213 to 215. With, uh, on relations with Quebec and to conduct negotiations with the government of Quebec and key organizations, associations in the private sector. So Catherine, welcome uh, to you as well to our, our session today. So uh, before we begin today's discussion, we'd ask both our guests to first provide us with a brief overview of their organization's mission here in the state. So if we would, can we begin with you, Anne? Sure, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and greetings from Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you, John, for the opportunity to participate in this, this very important discussion. And on behalf of Ontario, thank you to the Maple Business Council for hosting this session and, and for the great work that you're doing in New York and, and, and your colleagues as well across Canada and the United States. And it's always a pleasure to participate in these sessions with my Quebec counterpart and good friend, Catherine Louvier. I'd like to start by briefly describing my role in Ontario's presence in the United States. So we have trade and investment offices located in New York, Chicago, Dallas, and San Francisco. My office is situated, as John mentioned, in the Canadian embassy. Um, uh, in fact, it's the only embassy in the world uh, to be located between the White House and Capitol Hill, which speaks to the bond and the relationship between our two countries. I'm obviously working from home today, so apologies in advance if my Irish Terrier Finnegan starts barking. My team in Washington focuses primarily on federal engagement on Capitol Hill, the White House administration, namely the offices of the US Trade Representative, Agriculture, Energy, Commerce, and the State Department. We, uh, we interact with key staff for the Ways and Means Committee, the Northern Border Caucus, Finance, Energy, and Natural Resource Senate Committees. But we also spend an equal amount of time at, at the subnational level, working closely with the governor's offices and state representatives. It's an extremely important uh, relationship uh, at that level, uh, which well, I'll expand on further uh, during the Q&A. 
Regarding Ontario's trading relationship with the United States and particularly New York State, our common history, geographic proximity, shared economic interests, and interconnected supply chains resulted in over $300 billion in two-way trade last year. If Ontario, to put it in context, if Ontario were a, a standalone country, we would be the third largest trading partner to the United States. And Ontario accounts for more than half of the merchandise traded between Canada and the US. Ontario is the number one export destination for merchandise trade for 19 states and number two for an additional nine states. And I'd like to describe Ontario as, as the workshop of Canada. One, uh, our, you know, our, our manufacturing capability is, is really unrivaled and, and nearly 200 million consumers live within a day's delivery by truck and rail of our province. We have an extensive network of five international airports, 80 regional airports and 15 road, rail and marine border crossings to the US. Eight of those 15 border crossings are with New York State. Ontario and New York two-way trade totaled over $22 billion last year. And the goods we import and export with New York range from precious metals to telecom equipment for mobile phones, medications, prepared foods, petroleum products, motor vehicle and aircraft parts, and paper goods. But our most highly integrated industries are automotive, steel, and aluminum. Ontario is also a, a leading North American uh, center for financial services from banking, insurance and capital markets to the disaster recovery, data centers and financial app developers. We are a global leader in FinTech, including mobile payments, cybersecurity, trading analytics and, and blockchain. And Ontario is the second largest IT cluster on the continent with a wealth of world-class tech talent. In conclusion, regarding COVID-19, as Ontario and New York look to replenishing personal protective equipment and medical equipment stockpiles, we have unleashed our world-class manufacturing might to meet the PPE demands for healthcare professionals and frontline workers. Working together is something that comes naturally to Ontario and New York, and working together is how we can best ensure adequate availability of PPE for our citizens, both now through competitive sourcing and moving forward through shared manufacturing solutions. I would also draw your attention to the exciting North American Rebound Initiative, which we are a proud partner with Quebec and hundreds of North American organizations. I believe Catherine will describe this, this initiative in more detail. As the current health crisis reshapes our world, it is vital that New York and Ontario commit to fighting protectionism and promote the free flow of goods and ultimately opening up our shared border to once again enjoy travel, tourism, and the ability to visit family and friends on both sides of our border. And with that, uh, thank you again, and, and I look forward to our discussion. Sorry, thank you. I had it on mute there. <laughs> thank you very much for a very informative overview, Ian. Uh, if those of you, I, I apologize if my slides were blocking uh, Ian's image. Uh, he was uh, making a very nice presentation there, and I apologize if I uh, disrupted that. Uh, Catherine, uh, we'd like to turn it over to you as well. Yes, well, thank you, John, and uh, I'm thrilled to be joining uh, Ian Todd uh, today for this discussion. And I apologize in advance, I'm on uh, my cell phone instead of my laptop, so <laughs> it's not as convenient. Um, so, um, as you said, I was appointed uh, in uh, 19, uh, February of 19, um, and I oversee, I'm the Delegate General in the US, but I particularly oversee the Mid-Atlantic region, and um, that includes the office in Washington, in DC. And we have uh, also offices and I have colleagues in uh, New England, in the Midwest, uh, Chicago, um, as well as uh, Los Angeles and smaller offices in Houston, Atlanta, Silicon Valley, and a uh, person also in, in Philadelphia. So we have a massive network in the US and about 30 offices in the world. And um, we, uh, we work mainly on investment and trade but also uh, making uh, links with uh, academia, uh, recruiting talent, uh, accompanying our, our cultural industry, 
and of course, uh, uh, on the political level, uh, all the files that are touching on, um, uh, I would say, uh, promoting our interests, but also uh, defending our interests when it's time to do so. Um, and I, you know, this is a good time for us. We have very similar priorities as uh, the ones as the uh, federal administration. Of course, the COVID, the joint COVID recovery, same for New York, New York State. We're in constant uh, contact with uh, uh, the governor's team on, uh, on uh, COVID. We share a border. And so it's, it's extremely important that uh, we talk to each other about uh, the border and, and uh, uh, health measures. Um, but also, um, uh, you know, we work very well on a greener economy. Um, when I came in, I, I pushed a message that Quebec was the best partner for decarbonization of the Northeast, particularly of New York. And I think the message was heard in many, many ways, including uh, for uh, the transmission of more clean hydroelectricity to New York. Um, the economy uh, in Quebec, well, we're 8.5 million population and uh, currently uh, show a 8.8% unemployment rate, uh, where Canada is about at 9.4% unemployment. So before the crisis, we were, uh, that, that uh, percentage was very low and uh, we're extremely focused on uh, resorbing uh, our debt and uh, moving ahead with uh, stimulus. We export uh, 92 billion to the world and 64 billion of that in the US. Uh, so we value very much our first trading partner and we don't take the relationship for granted. That's why we are present in the United States and we engage with our companies uh, either exporting or wanting to ex export for the first time. And to give you an idea, this, uh, the, the level of exports to uh, New York is uh, just over 8 billion. Well, to put this into perspective, uh, that's more than we export uh, to France, Germany, uh, and the UK combined. So uh, New York and, and I think Quebec and especially Montreal have a sort of a love story. Uh, you know, New Yorkers like our creativity, our artists, and uh, the, first, the first destination for businesses in Quebec is, is New York, is Manhattan. Um, uh, these days, I have a, a couple priorities. Uh, of course, as I said, accompanying small, medium, large companies to do more business with New York and in the U.S. generally, but also to, um, uh, you know, uh, and I think we'll talk about that later, um, uh, work on this wonderful project, this fantastic project of exporting more hydroelectricity to New York, which will bring cleaner air and better health to New Yorkers, create jobs and uh, contribute to the prosperity of, of Quebec and Canada as a whole. Um, we're also, uh, you know, Quebec is critical mineral rich. So those critical and strategic minerals present in uh, the battery of the future, the uh, telecom, uh, uh, telephones, and uh, even in medicine, uh, these critical minerals are present also in Ontario, and uh, but certainly in Quebec. And so we're we're pushing uh, uh, these minerals uh, so that we can reduce the dependency of the US on China, uh, which is an objective of the, the previous and uh, the current administration. And more particularly, um, we want to uh, be the, the new hub in North America for uh, the components in uh, the battery cell uh, in, that will go in the batteries for electrification of the fleet of the large OEMs. And, uh, again, we're complementary to what's uh, going on in Ontario. We have a very, I think, strategic, good strategic vision of the supply chain in the auto industry and how Quebec can contribute with its uh, expertise, Hydro-Quebec expertise, but also minerals. So that's another really important uh, one for us. And we offer also recycling solutions for those uh, batteries um, with our companies in Quebec. Um, the, you spoke about the rebound, the North American rebound. It's NorthAmericanRebound.com. When the COVID crisis started, we thought, wow, there is a, a, a real movement of, of uh, turning uh, towards ourselves and, and thinking we should, you know, protectionist movement. And so we thought it was important to give a voice to all those companies and manufacturers that advocate to keep our supply chains open. And uh, I don't have to explain to you, but we're so integrated and, and we would, you know, auto inflict some damages on ourselves if we, we would uh, 
uh, interfere with these uh, critical supply chains. And we know that more than ever during this COVID crisis. So there's about 650,000 business council chambers of, of commerce that have joined the rebound. And when we go and meet with legislators and other um, important influencers, we're not alone. We're strong of, of this group and hopefully you know, strong of, of uh, the Maple Business Council uh, members as well, because I think we, we all advocate for a, a joint recovery and, uh, and keeping our, our, our trade open. Um, yeah, and in conclusion, I would say we hear a lot about made in America uh, these days, but um, I, you know, I think our message will be let's build North American and let's build greener North American. Uh, our uh, electricity is 99.6% uh, from renewables sources in Quebec. And that means that we produce green as well. The greenest aluminum in the world that uh, we export, uh, those export, uh, hydroelectricity export projects are the most important uh, renewable projects in North America right now. And Hydro-Quebec is the largest renewable generator in uh, North America. Uh, and, you know, around Hydro-Quebec grew a bunch of companies uh, able to uh, put charging station right into New York City, help buildings uh, be greener, uh, help trucks be greener, and so we've engaged very, very uh, uh, energetically with uh, New York uh, public contracts, but also New York businesses to partner up and speed up electrification and the greening our, of our economy. And I think that's probably the most important angle that, that I can bring uh, in this introduction today. Thank you, Catherine, that was excellent. I appreciate that overview. And we're gonna get into hydro in particular in a minute or two. Uh, but before we uh, go to that question, I, I think I'd like to get this big one out of the way first, which uh, <laughs> I'd ask both of you to comment on. Uh, we've all seen the recent uh, executive order uh, by President Biden to uh, Buy American, which I'm reading up on now, I understand is different than Buy America. Uh, and uh, I'd appreciate your insight into that legislation. I know Canada and the U.S. are working to try to figure out how to uh, work that because as you mentioned, I think both of you mentioned, we're a highly integrated economy now. But how do you see that impacting trade, particularly the trade here with uh, the New York market? And uh, maybe we can start with uh, you, Ian, if that's okay. Sure, well, thank you, John. Well, there's there's no question. We're, we're, we're very disappointed the U.S. administration has chosen to move ahead with a new executive order on, on Buy American, which would certainly restrict access to U.S. government procurement. And these Buy American policies, they, they do disrupt existing, long-standing Ontario, U.S., New York, cross-border supply chains. Um, but we don't, we don't take these important relationships for granted. And and in that regard, Ontario has recently um, taken a proactive approach by pursuing what we call strategic investment procurement agreements, uh, uh, the acronym being SIPAs. Um, uh, and we're doing this with, with a number of US states and, and most recently with our good friends in the beautiful state of Maryland. Uh, the first agreement of its kind for Ontario, and, and we're very excited about the potential uh, for this, this agreement and, and those that, that follow. And these, these agreements will really secure improved access uh, to investment and, and government procurement opportunity for, for businesses on, on both sides of the border. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. And Catherine, you mentioned that uh, 64 billion, I think, of 92 billion of Quebec's trade is with the U.S. So how do you how do you see this uh, new order? Well, impacting? I mean the the protectionist uh, measures are, are always bad news, uh, as Ian said. Uh, for us, we think you know they tend to because we're so integrated, ten they tend to drive prices up, uh, uh, reduce competition, and lose. You know, there, there's a, a tone that's been given by the Biden administration now with. Uh, Made in America and the executive order. That said, um, we we Canada is exempt uh, from Buy American uh, as part of uh, it being uh, in the WTO and uh, GPA, the Global Procurement Agreement. That doesn't mean that this can't change over time. But uh, I think that uh, the first conversations between the president and the prime minister uh, were encouraging. 
Uh, they did know that they would work on keeping our supply chains open. I think uh, that the president also views Canada as a partner and not uh, 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 an enemy, I should say. Um, and, and I think it, it will be important to explain uh, that those supply chains are vital um, to both countries and that uh, together, because of, of how we build things together, we compete together, uh, uh, including uh, towards China. And so uh, Buy America is, is another story. I think there is a risk of expansion of Buy America. Uh, and uh, we, we very strongly oppose an expansion of, of Buy America. And we intend to um, work with more manufacturing companies in the US and in Canada to show how, in fact, uh, we have suppliers on one side and the other side of the border. For public contracts, this would mean probably for a company that plies cement or liquid asphalt in, in Quebec. Uh, they, if, if they would need to find it somewhere else, it means, you know, a cost for that company. It means that less roads will be built. Uh, if it's a major road builder, uh, like the one I have in mind, it means they will have to supply these uh, materials uh, from, uh, you know, on barges that just in time won't be there. There's a lot of disadvantage. So I think manufacturers are behind us on, on this. Uh, we feel this in, in the North American rebound as well. And, uh, and uh, we need to work, uh, do our homeworks with legislators um, in, in Washington, DC. And I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm eager to work with Ontario and, and other provinces. We, we work often as Team Canada when we meet uh, important uh, legislators and, uh, the, and Congress and, and so on. It was easier when we could do it uh, by uh, driving or flying to Washington, but <laughs> It's still, um, I guess, possible now when uh, I think we have a good, strong Team Canada message and uh, we need to recover together and we need to continue to have, uh, you know, build champions in North America together. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, I, I, I've seen, although trade has grown, right, the volume of trade between our countries has grown, uh, there is a, a slowing uh, or there is less trade, let's say, because we're both importing more from China than we were 10 years ago. So I, I agree 100 percent. The threat is not coming from each other. It's it's from other markets and we need to work more closely. And since you raised yeah, I mean, it, you take the, yeah. the aluminum tariffs file. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the aluminum tariffs file was a, was an example of, of Team Canada coming together and yeah. and basically saying, you know, um, this is helping our, our foreign uh, adversaries. It's not helping our, our allies, so. Exactly. Yeah, so for, this is for both of you to comment on. Uh, one of the things that always impressed me about uh, the Canadian embassy staff and even the ambassador himself at the time uh, to the US from Canada and the provincial staff, uh, trade staff based here in the States and the consulates is that while serving as president of Purelayer, a logistics company, I, I never had to really promote how important it was to these groups to keep the supply chain open and, and keep the border uh, uh, flow of trade moving uh, nicely. And you know, when you look at uh, the things that have been uh, created, as Catherine was alluding to, with uh, border state province uh, infrastructure support, right? The lowering of customs, de minimis, and duty levels, which I know. Canada was very supportive of and worked very closely with the US government on to increase the amount of importing exporting. The harmonization of import export regulations, this new window initiative that came out a few years ago that uh, uh, Canada and the US have agreed to to ease clearance of uh, material coming across the borders. All of this uh, is very, very important to us. And why, why is that? Maybe you can expound a bit on uh, the importance of keeping that border infrastructure and trade flow moving slowly. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> flowing nice and uh, smoothly. Uh, why don't we start with, uh, with Ian on this one? Well, um, uh, further to your point about uh, our federal Canadian colleagues in, in the embassy, uh, I just have to, I have to say that uh, Ambassador Hillman and, and the team at the embassy uh, are just a very talented and, and dedicated group of, of professionals. We're very, very fortunate as Canadians to have them uh, in Washington and, and their colleagues across the United States. And, and as Catherine mentioned, we really do take a Team Canada approach on many issues and, and uh, it's, it's working very well. 
Um, I, I think I think you're alluding to or trying to get to the question of when when are borders actually going to. That will be a next yeah the next question, but you can trust that now if you'd like. Yes. Well, um, um, I, I think that's it, it's it's the uh, the question we're we're asking ourselves almost every day, but it's very very difficult to predict. Uh, um, uh, you know, I think at the at the moment the mandatory testing we have in place at at, at the borders are, are our most important thing that we can do to. And stop the spread of, of, um, of COVID. But fortunately, as you mentioned, our supply chains have remained very strong and, and intact. Um, but it, it's it's virtually impossible uh, to predict when that will happen. But but fortunately, uh, supply chains have remained strong. Thank you, Catherine. I know that uh, Quebec has worked very hard to keep that border between New York and Canada open. The Champlain district and the the uh, initiative with Plattsburgh and other things. Maybe you can comment a bit on that as well. And when do you see things opening up again? Yes, you know, it's so important that I, I didn't know that. But when I took this job, I ended up going to Plattsburgh several times. So the first time I went, I went to uh, uh, the border and I met with the border agents and we would discuss, you know, trade between uh, Quebec and, and New York. I thought that was a constructive uh, meeting and uh, that speaks to the importance of it and, and how, you know, we came from almost nothing at that border to a very sophisticated border today with uh, strategic investments, mostly from the federal government, but we followed up with roads and uh, whatever falls into the, the provincial jurisdiction. We're very fortunate to have preclearance as well, and, and we're looking to have that for uh, rail. Listen, we, my job is really to serve industry, and industry wants to cross the border. And as Ian said, that uh, truck traffic is almost the same as, as uh, before COVID, almost to the same level, which is excellent news. So the border is open to essential. Uh, with everything happening these days, we are really carefully uh, uh, champions, job creators, exporters. Some of them have thousands of trucks a week, you know, several tens of, of people and experts crossing the border every day. We want to protect that. That is what we want to do because uh, this is working. And, and if we undo that, there, there will be some serious consequences. So I'm in touch with the Federation of uh, Border of Trades of Quebec, which represents 50 or so companies. And uh, having phone calls from some of our exporters every day uh, and working with the Consul General in uh, office in Montreal as well to see, okay, what's changing? Is Are the questions at the border changing? Is it more difficult? How is you know, go, what is, how's the border gonna look in, in a few years from now? Or uh, we've sat down with the Future Border Coalition to discuss, you know, uh, how this could work. It's easier for truckers because there's uh, a lot of technology uh, present already. Uh, but, you know, most of all, we're, Quebec is a is free trader. We've been uh, uh, very active and instrumental in uh, the negotiation of NAFTA, of USMCA and of CETA uh, with, uh, with Europe. And so I think my one of my number one job, and I know uh, Ian, you said you think about that every day, I do too. We gotta keep those people and goods moving. Yeah. yeah. No, I, 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 border. I, yeah. Even if it's the health and safety. So I think it's a balance. Uh, it, we have to be creative. We have to find ways. We have to have the technology. We have to have the testing. Uh, the vaccines and, and I think all of that is is building the plane as it as it's flying, but I think we'll we'll get there. And I'm always amazed that companies like Pure Later uh, that uh, you know don't they don't stop. They the logistics goes on, and and so you know it is working. So yeah. it, but we need to preserve that and find ways to have also people uh, move through the border, including health workers. Yeah, I made several visits to Washington as, when I was with Pure Later as president, and uh, my intention was to, lob, so to speak, lobby uh, officials there mm -hmm. as an American, right, how important this border was. And I, I would come with these extensive notes, and invariably the ambassador or somebody from the staff in, in Washington would take over the conversation and could, could not have done a better job of explaining the importance of logistics and free trade and, and the movement of goods across the border. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think it is very important. And, and I think a, a big part of the mission is to make sure that we 
here on this side. And I think the, the US does the same within Canada, right? To make mm -hmm. sure that uh, we're harmonizing our regulations so that we're not uh, obstructing trade. I, I think I'm gonna ask, uh, we have uh, James Medora on the line from Newsday. And he had a question, a uh, follow-up question uh, regarding uh, the Buy American provision. And I don't know, Robert, if we can open up the, uh, yeah, we can open it up for, for James. Uh, James is a business reporter with Newsday here in Long Island. Uh, I think he also has some roots uh, in Canada, which he may share with us. James, are you there? Yes, uh, John, thank you very much. I appreciate you letting me uh, join the conversation. Um, so uh, full disclosure to your guests, um, my last name is French Canadian and my <laughs> father and all of his siblings were born um, just south of Quebec City. So my question uh, to you both um, is there is a lot of support that I hear from U.S. manufacturers, particularly manufacturers in New York State, for President Biden's Buy American proposals, which, as you know, focus on federal procurement and also focus on a requirement that federally funded transportation projects would have to use American-made building materials. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how that could damage the very important trade relationships between New York State companies, Long Island companies, and their counterparts in Quebec and Ontario. I'll defer to Catherine, given your, your Quebec connection there. Yeah, well, I mean, south of Quebec City would be where, where my family comes from. So all the way, you know, closer to the main border. So it's nice to, it's nice to see the connection there. Um, well, I think that, you know, um, there are, there are uh, you know, my friend Gary Douglas at the uh, North Country Chamber uh, and I uh, have have visited and, and speak almost every week on the border and on the uh, Buy American executive order. Of course, Buy America makes it so that companies like Bombardier and Novabus have to have uh, supplies to a level uh, from uh, the U.S. and as well assembly uh, uh, plants, and that's that's a lot of them are in Plattsburgh, and so Mr. Douglas is happy. Uh, listen, we've we've found a way to have a win-win. Uh, the headquarters of these companies are, are in Quebec. Uh, there's jobs, uh, of course, in Quebec, uh, but there's some on the U.S. side, which is fine. If 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 it's a win-win, if 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 you know we're able to continue to build uh, champions like Alstom, Bombardier, and and Novabus. Um, the I would say you know there's probably support out there, but there's also people who know that this will. Uh, uh, further, uh, uh, you know, like I said earlier, um, increase costs and diminish um, competition, and, and at the end of the day, will be a lose lose for both sides of the border. Um, and uh, you know, we we have open communication with a lot of uh, business association in New York uh, chambers and uh, and as well uh, government channels, and uh, we have a binational caucus that looks at these trade issues and. We have a lot of discussions on, on how to make it a win-win for both uh, Quebec and New York. And I'm confident that uh, ahead, uh, you know, we'll team up together and, uh, and uh, continue to, uh, to build this, this great regional superpower that we've become, uh, which is Ontario, New York, the Great Lakes area. Uh, if you look at the GDP of, of this region, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, so we'll see what ahead, but I know uh, uh, very good allies at the border on both sides uh, of, of the house. I mean, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if, if, if they're Republican or, or if, if they're Democratic, Democrat. I think that um, elected representatives at the border understand that it's important that we continue to, uh, to keep those supply chains open. Thank you. Thank you. James, did you have one other question before I uh, go back well, to... Uh... Just, act, just quickly echo uh, uh, okay. comments, uh, you know, when you actually sit down and start having the conversation with elected representatives in, in both parties and, and business uh, 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 in the United States, uh, they do, people do very quickly recognize and acknowledge the, the importance of, of the, the, the regional uh, relationship and, and just how, how 
impressive it is really when you look at it. Um, uh, I mean, there's, there's almost 700,000 jobs in the state of New York uh, alone that depend on, on bilateral, tr bilateral trade relationship between, uh, mm -hmm. between Canada and the US. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just very, very significant and, and people are very quick to, to acknowledge and recognize the importance of, of, uh, of the region and, and that continued growth. Thank you, Ian. Yep, uh, Pure Later had 100 people here on Long Island, uh, dependent highly, 100% actually, on trade with Canada. So couldn't agree more. Um, so I'm going to come back to hydro uh, power in a moment, uh, Catherine, because I'd like to get your perspective on, on how that's progressing between New York. But I want to go first to Ian, uh, because in the news, we're all seeing quite a bit of uh, splashback, so to speak, on this decision made to shut down the Keystone Pipeline. and uh, Perhaps, Ian, you can give us a bit of your perspective on that and how that affects uh, the relationship currently between the U.S. and Canada. Well, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's disappointing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, we work closely with with our colleagues uh, in in Alberta and and of course Quebec and Saskatchewan with respect to uh, Keystone XL and 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 most recently. Uh, the decision coming on Enbridge's Line Five, which uh, which runs through uh, Mi Michigan and supplies uh, uh, a great deal of fuel to uh, for home heating in the state of Michigan, and would impact uh, factories in 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 several states, uh, including Southern Ontario, Pearson Airport in Toronto, and, and the province of Quebec as well. So we're we're very actively engaged on on that issue with our federal colleagues in other provinces and. And the state that we're impacted on. We spent a great deal of time on. Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to get that question because somebody had asked that question and I knew it was going to come up again. So thank you for, for addressing that. Um, Catherine, coming back to you on the hydro power initiatives, uh, Governor Cuomo has set a date in the future where all New York state government would be completely sustainable, carbon neutral, and uh, has expressed openly that we need to get that power system set in place so we can get hydro into New York to, uh, to meet our needs sustainably. So can you give us an update on how that initiative is going and uh, what we can expect in the future? Sure, uh, with pleasure. So as I said, I think it's a fantastic project. Uh, when I, when I uh, was appointed, I, I, I thought there is a surplus of clean hydroelectricity that we have in Quebec. There is uh, a desire and an ambitious governor uh, with, a, at the time, the CLCPA was passed. It was in the works, uh, that, uh, that bill that, that makes it, uh, that uh, uh, contains the objectives of the state with regards to climate change. And then uh, the, the same governor had promised to close down uh, the nuclear plant, Indian Point, and that energy would have to come from somewhere else. And, uh, and that's part of the reason why I took this job. I thought this is, this is a good situation, but we need to make this work. And um, I think the, the, way, the way that, uh, and you know, it's a tremendous legacy that, that we have um, uh, in Quebec. It's an uh, amazing legacy from those who have been uh, there before. And uh, we were just talking about the Beauce region south of Quebec City. It's where my grandfather came from and he helped build the Beijing. So he worked on the construction site. So I'm, uh, I'm also very proud of that. Um, I think one of the things we needed to do was uh, go back to stakeholders, go back to NGOs, go back to uh, government uh, uh, elected representatives and go back to unions and, and everyone and, and just explain why we wanna do this. What's the driver and answer questions, you know, on uh, where does the hydro come from? How do you manage your environmental? Uh, aspects. How do you work with your communities? We've just announced a tremendous project for more wind uh, farms uh, in Quebec with the Inu Nation, um, for example, and we have a, a very strong alliance with the Cree Nation. So I think there was a lot of education to do and just explain what's the driver, what's our DNA, why are we doing this? And so uh, effectively we did uh, myself and my, my staff over 250 meetings. And, and sort of created a, a way and, and paved the way for uh, you know, uh, our, our politicians to be able to go forward with this. And uh, one of the big changes that was required was the regulation. Um, and a change in regulation was announced in September, allowing first for uh, clean hydro to be recognized as a renewable energy in New York. 
and second, to be able to bid um, on uh, uh, requests for proposals for energy in the state. That RFP has been launched uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, Hydro-Quebec, uh, the company in Quebec, which uh, uh, is an independent uh, company from the government, but providing dividends to the government, is preparing a submission uh, to sell energy, to channel energy, and also to build an additional or, or several additional um, transmission lines. And so we were thrilled when Governor Cuomo uh, repeatedly and most recently in the state of the state uh, doubled down saying that he would like to get it, get it done for once and, and get the energy from Canada, Quebec, all the way down to New York City, because that's where we're not able to to uh, bring electricity. We're exporting since 100 years in the north uh, of the state, but not in New York City. So what, where the big peakers are, and uh, it's, a, it's an HVDC uh, cable. It's a cable partly underwater, under Champlain and, and, and the Hudson River. And it's a 333 mile uh, electric cord, you could say. Uh, that will uh, that will allow us to to clean the air and and increase the health of uh, of New Yorkers. So uh, that's that's about two thousand jobs in New York. There's a similar project, as you know, uh, to get more energy through Maine to Massachusetts. Uh, that's I think sixteen hundred jobs for the construction. So the advantages are are job creation, economic benefit, health benefit, and of course cleaning up the air. And, uh, and that's uh, of utmost importance for us in Quebec, the government of Quebec, as well as, as, uh, as Governor Cuomo. So uh, the uh, timeline for the RFP is well established, it's public. So uh, next summer, we should have a clearer idea of which bids uh, have been uh, put forward and, uh, and what NYSERDA uh, will decide on those bids. That's a great image you just uh, presented us uh, of a giant electric cord, 330 miles long, plugged into the network. <laughs> great. Um, I'd like to switch a little bit. We have a lot of folks online here today that are in the tech industry uh, or digital business, so to speak. And all of us have obviously invested heavily in that whole uh, area of business. And uh, I read recently that the tech industry along the card are running from 401 to uh, from Waterloo to Toronto, uh, and of course, Quebec itself as well, uh, are now rivaling the tech talent in Silicon Valley. The question I have is why is this and what can you share with our guests today about this and, and how they might tap into that talent? Maybe start this one with Ian. Sure, well, Ontario's very talented workforce has, has helped drive this uh, tech corridor with leading clusters in, in Waterloo, which is very well known, Toronto, Toronto and Ottawa, of course, um, and to be the second largest information technology uh, sector in North America after California, uh, something we're very proud of and is, is growing rapidly. Uh, Toronto, as I've mentioned earlier, is North America's uh, number three market for tech talent after the San Francisco Bay Area and Seattle, and, and more than two thirds of Ontario adults have a post-secondary education. Uh, this is a rate higher than any other uh, of the 37 member countries belonging to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. It's, it's an extremely high number of uh, uh, post-secondary uh, grads. And the University of Toronto, another example, ranks among the top 20 global universities. And the University of Waterloo, uh, and it graduates, uh, uh, they, they are the second most frequently hired uh, by six Silicon Valley companies. Uh, and, and many of these graduates are now uh, uh, choosing to remain in Ontario, uh, which, which drives that uh, tech corridor as well. And, and again, for any, any companies that are uh, interested in tapping into this ecosystem, uh, by all means, please reach out to me and, and uh, be happy to support you on that. Thank you, Ian. Catherine, do you want to touch on the, the uh, tech market in Quebec and the talent available there? Sure. I, I thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think you know, I, in the uh, in the nineties, uh, Montreal positioned itself for the multimedia uh, industry and invested uh, heavily in the training of of uh, the young workforce, and that that has paid off uh, a lot. And we were able to attract a number of companies 
And today these same uh, trainee and, and now they're older, but they're, uh, they're working in FinTech companies, they're working in tech companies. And I'd say Montreal continues to attract small mid-sized companies to seek advantage of the AI cluster uh, that we have. I think we're recognized in the world for the AI cluster that we've developed, and especially in research and deep learning. And we have players like Samsung, Facebook, Google, and Amazon who have presence in Montreal. And a lot of startups also, notably from New York, choose Montreal to uh, recently, we've had a Swift a CTRL, a prop tech company, a security tech company called Bus Patrol, uh, the guarantors, uh, pro tech and insurance tech. Um, so this is definitely what we continue to attract. We have a great pool of talent, uh, bilingual, multilingual. Um, we also have uh, uh, access to, uh, no, a family can buy a house in Montreal. That's quite important. Quality of life, easy immigration. Uh, with um, a hiring uh, contract, and we're talking a couple weeks, thanks to our collaboration with the federal government also. Um, and so, uh, and there's also the cool factor uh, in, uh, in Quebec. I think Quebec rhymes with creativity, and that's something that a lot of industries are striving for uh, these days. Sorry, I had to unmute you there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's uh, the AI, I wasn't aware that the AI market was so strong in Quebec. It's something I've learned today. It's also a, uh, a major uh, sector here in New York, as you know. Uh, so I think there's a good opportunity for collaboration there in the future as we both grow our economies. Uh, maybe our last question, it kind of relates to- uh, we do, uh, Sorry? We do a research project. Okay. I was, was gonna say we do actually, you're right. And, and we're collaborating and we have research projects together and observatories of, of uh, ethical AI. And so we're well engaged with New York on uh, that topic. Okay, thank you. So uh, one of, another question, and there's a few questions surrounding this a bit. I know James had one uh, regarding opportunities for businesses here in Long Island to invest and grow their business within the Canadian market. And somebody else had asked a question I saw in the uh, Q&A about the Canadian banking industry being you know, uh, aggressive here uh, in recent years. And in fact, we're going to hear from the Toronto Mo uh, Stock Exchange uh, TMX group uh, in uh, March about their efforts to provide capital, the smaller mid-sized companies looking to invest in the Canadian market. So if you were advising uh, a U.S. company, particularly one here in New York, on the resources and support available to invest in Canada to expand their business uh, and perhaps Conversely, to uh, secure business in Canada to grow their business, right, uh, from Canadian companies. Uh, that's a big question, I know, but if you could perhaps both give some insight around that topic, I'd appreciate it. We can start this one maybe with Ian. Well, with, with respect to New York-based companies, New York State-based companies looking at Ontario uh, uh, for expansion uh, and investment, um, uh, of course, we've got we've got the talented workforce that that I, I talked about. Uh, um, our, our banking system, uh, one of the most reliable in the world, um, and uh, our education, healthcare, uh, uh, quality of life, cost of living. There's just so many so many um, uh, advantages in, uh, to the Ontario uh, climate, uh, business climate. That uh, we're finding a lot of a lot of companies are are obviously looking to expand into the province. It's, it's uh, seeing tremendous growth. Thank you, thank you, Ian. Catherine, if you were a Long Island company or a New York company looking to invest in Canada, what sectors should they be looking at, do you think? Well, if I was a Long Island a company, I would speak to the Long Island Association first, where I was able to speak to, <laughs> to talk about the, these topics. <laughs> Um, no, but I mean, we have a, an agency uh, that's called Invest Quebec, uh, and we have very competent uh, um, uh, uh, people in New York, Ben, my office, and we literally take a company by the hand, uh, whether it's looking for a uh, DJ partner uh, or we prefer no acquisition, that's Sometimes it's positive. Um, 
and lead them by the hand through the advantages that we have in terms of factors that we support, um, but also to have them meet with the business community in Quebec and, and so that they see, you know, potential clients, potential uh, partners. Um, we have some capital uh, available, of course. Catherine's screen seems to have frozen there. Uh, hopefully it's not mine. Can you hear me, Ian? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, hopefully we get Catherine back shortly. Uh, and I think uh, we're coming towards the end here. So I'm gonna uh, just quickly wrap up if I could uh, by sharing my screen. Um, there we go. Um, you know, I wanna thank first, uh, I hope Catherine can hear me, Catherine and Ian for joining us today and giving us these insights that are gonna help us continue the most important trade relationship I think between the United States and, and Canada. And that is the trilateral strength of the relationship between uh, Ontario, Quebec, and New York. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 86% uh, of New York's exports uh, land in Canada. So I can't think of a more important uh, market for the New York, uh, our New York constituents. Uh, and the same is true as we heard from Ian and, and Catherine in reverse. So thank you again for, for doing this for us today. Uh, what I would, can you see my screen by the way? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, let me see if I could uh, open this up. And no, of course I can't. So <laughs> we're going to have to I'm use I'm sorry this. If, I, if I cut out for a minute. I'm sorry about that. Oh, no problem, Technology. Catherine. Thank you. Oh, no trouble. No trouble. Thank you. Um, so um, I was just saying, I'm going to wrap up here to say that we hope you consider uh, becoming part of Maple in the future. Uh, one of the things I wanted to emphasize here is that we cover Canada and the U.S. economic ties, we believe, like, like no other business community here in the States uh, and in Canada. Uh, joining Maple brings a Canadian U.S. executive network to you. As I mentioned, over 80% of our members are at the director or a higher level. You can uh, join us for hopefully in the not too distant future live events like this, where you can network in person uh, and now video or virtual uh, to share insights through our content platforms and stay on top of key issues and, and initiatives. Uh, we're very proud to be partners with the Consul Generals of Canada here in the States, uh, the U.S. Commercial Service, the uh, Empire State Development uh, Agency here in New York, econo other economic development agencies and stakeholders like the Ontario government, Trade and Invest, and the uh, Quebec delegation. Uh, if you'd like to know more about membership in Maple, I hope you'll contact me. It's a very simple email address there. Uh, John at maplecouncil.org. I'd be happy to help you uh, understand the benefits you might derive from membership in our community. And you could always just go on our website, www.maplecouncil.org, to find out more information about our organization. I want to thank everybody. We had probably the best attendance ever uh, since I've been with Maple. Maybe there's been greater before, but I think it's due to the quality of our panelists today and the importance of the subject matter. So I thank you again. Thank you all of you for joining us. And please be sure to join us on March 4th in our Southern California event, uh, which I think you'll enjoy just uh, equally well. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.